All right, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, I am really excited to see so many people here uh, to learn about the Recycling Modernization Act and the changes it will bring to recycling here in Oregon starting in July of 2025. Um, today, we're starting the conversation with local governments and service providers uh, about how to prepare for their new role, new role in the recycling system uh, of the future. And uh, you notice that we are recording this webinar and we um, will make it available upon request. We also know that with this many people here um, all having questions, um, it, we may not get to all of them. We may not be able to answer all of them. So uh, we're going to send out um, a FAQ after the webinar where we can really get into everybody's um, and respond to everybody. So just wanted to put that out there um, right at the beginning because I think um, you know everybody's coming from a different place with, with different um, questions. So. Um, but first things first, uh, I'm Ariane Sperry. I'm the implementation lead for the Recycling Modernization Act with DEQ. Hey, Ariane. Uh, yeah. Uh, some folks were saying you're just a little quiet. I was wondering um, maybe if you could move your mic to... just a little closer. See if I could do that. I'll try to speak up a little more. Does that help? Hopefully. Yeah, you sound a little better. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I worked in local government uh, in the recycling world for over a decade and joined DEQ a little over a year ago to help coordinate implementation of the Recycling Modernization Act. And uh, today we're in the steady hands of our Zoom master, Alex Bertolucci, and uh, he will be popping in now and again to keep things running smoothly. So thank you, Alex. Um, and we're joined today by Kim Holmes, a local consultant that many of you know has tons of experience and who is now working with Circular Action Alliance, a producer responsibility organization interested in administering many elements of Oregon's recycling system. So today uh, we're gonna share uh, the, the conversation. So I'm gonna start by giving an overview of the RMA, talking about new obligations and funding focused on local governments and their service providers, and um, also focus on what's coming for the next uh, year plus as we look towards the launch of the new program in July of 2025, and then um, give you some key action steps, takeaways um, as you go on with your day. Um, and then um, Circular Action Alliance, um, Kim will be introducing the perspective producer responsibility organization and um, talking about what they're up to for the next year plus, and um, also talking about how they will be engaging with local governments and their service providers through um, the next phase um, of learning about Oregon system and improving Oregon system. Um, they're calling it the Oregon Recycling System Optimization Project. Uh, they also will be reaching out to have conversations around funding this summer, and they have some considerations um, for local governments and service providers to take away as well. And so that's what we're going to talk about. And Alex, do you want to talk about questions? Yeah. So because there are so many of us today, there's almost 200 folks on the call, we wanna make sure that we see all your questions and the chat can get a little unwieldy at times. So we want uh, folks to use the question and answer, uh, the Q&A tab there at the bottom of your screen in your Zoom control bar. If you have questions, put them in there. We'll try to answer as many as we can today, but I'm sure there's gonna be more questions than we have time for. So put those in there, we'll gather all of those and we'll make sure to put out a FAQ uh, after the um, uh, webinar today. We also ask that folks keep uh, their mute on so that we don't have any background noise. Uh, 
But yeah, use that Q&A feature so that we can keep track of those. If we don't get it answered today, we'll make sure to follow up with the answer for you. Great, thank you. So uh, it's gonna take a lot of different uh, folks uh, to fully implement the Recycling Modernization Act. And at Department of Environmental Quality, um, it's the Materials Management Program that is leading that effort. Um, the Materials Management Program is guided by its strategic plan, the 2050 Vision for Sustainable Materials Management in Oregon. Now, materials management is an approach to serving human needs by using and reusing resources most productively and sustainably throughout their life cycles. So um, generally minimizing the amount of materials involved and all the associated environmental impacts. The 2050 vision describes a future where Oregonians responsibly conserve resources, protect the environment and live well. So the Recycling Modernization Act aligns with the 2050 vision and supports DEQ's approach to sustainable materials management by considering the environmental impact of how we manage materials across their entire life cycle, including how they're managed at the end of them. While the focus is predominantly on recycling, the act takes life cycle impacts and costs into consideration in optimizing the recycling system, and it also includes reuse and other upstream elements. So that's just a little preamble about us. Um, the foundation for the Recycling Modernization Act was laid over many years. In 2017, major disruptions in international recycling markets highlighted some of the underlying issues in the recycling system, both at home and abroad, and created opportunities to take a closer look at the challenges that we've all been facing for some time. Some of the topics included dependence on global market conditions, unequal access to recycling collection in rural communities and smaller towns, and inconsistency and confusion over what could be recycled depending on where you lived or worked. And that was compounded by a new understanding that our recycling practices can impact communities across the globe. So in 2018, DEQ convened a recycling steering committee that met for two years and developed a consensus framework for modernizing Oregon's recycling system. And that really formed the basis for the legislative concept that became the Recycling Modernization Act. The law went into effect in January of 2022, which initiated a multi-year implementation process. And we are more than halfway through it. And we're all working together to build our future recycling system and really appreciate everyone who has been engaged throughout. So a little bit more about the uh, RMA. Um, this slide highlights that um, this is a really uniquely Oregon um, law. Yeah. Uh, we use a shared responsibility model. And I think this slide is really important because it shows that we all have a new role to play and we're all taking on new obligations to build a new recycling system for our state. So here is how it works. First, producers of materials that are deemed covered products will be required to join a producer responsibility organization, also known as PR, and pay fees based on the quantity of material they are selling. So a producer responsibility organization is a nonprofit organization that is formed to administer and implement the elements of the law they will collect fees from producers that will be distributed to support and expand recycling services throughout the state. As mentioned earlier, Circular Action Alliance, or CAA, has expressed interest in becoming a PR for this program. Now, local governments and service providers will update recycling services to meet new standards and play a key role in reducing contamination. Commingled recycling processing facilities will be required to meet new performance standards, including ensuring that they are sending recyclable materials to responsible end markets. And our role at DEQ is to implement and oversee the act. And we also have a recycling council advising DEQ and the PRO. So we're all working together to make this happen. And in terms of scope, I mentioned that uh, 
producers of covered products will be required to pay fees for the products they sell in Oregon. The RMA covers uh, packaging for most of the things you see in the grocery store, but not everything that is recycled. So under the law, covered products includes a broad range of packaging, printing and writing paper, and food service work. And some examples are shown in the book. Several products are specifically exempted in the law, like paint, napkins and paper towels, products used by farms and nurseries, and drug packaging. Those are some of the things not considered covered products under the Recycling Modernization Act. Beverage containers that are covered by Oregon's bottle bill are also not subject to the requirements of our name. And um, just uh, because it's often confusing, um, the law also does not apply to bulky waste, like carpet, mattresses, and furniture. So let's look into the future and imagine what recycling in Oregon will look like when the act is fully implemented. One of the main ways the RMA will modernize the recycling system is by expanding the system, especially in rural areas. Under the new system, cities with more than 4,000 residents will collect a uniform statewide collection list of materials. Funding from producers will help cover the cost of new trucks, bins, collection vehicles, um, collection depots, and recycling relay facilities, which are places where smaller loads of recyclables are combined before being transported long distances for processing. Producers will also pay to transport materials that need to travel 50 or more miles to reach a processor and market. Expanded recycling will happen both curbside and at physical local collection points like depots in rural communities. For a second list of materials that are harder to recycle, the PRO will be required to establish a network of collection points, such as return to retail and depots. These collection points will have a density similar to U.S. post offices across the state. I just referenced new recycling acceptance lists. I'll get into these more in detail later. For now, we'll drop a link to these in the chat and just note that these lists mean that people living in Medford or Bandon will have the same list of accepted recycling materials as people in Gresham and Hillsborough. Those living in the Portland metro area will have a very similar recycling list to what they see today with a few additional items added and a few removed. And note that these lists may change over time the PRO could propose additional materials to add for statewide collection in their program plans, which would be reviewed by the DEQ and the Recycling Council. People who live in multifamily housing will start to see changes in late 2026, when Oregon's opportunity to recycle law will be extended to include them. Also, new and remodeled apartment buildings will need to include adequate space for recycling. The facilities that process the recyclables we put in our bins are at the front lines of recycling. They take mixed recycling, also called commingled recycling, from around the state and sort it so other companies can turn it into raw materials or feedstocks for new products. These facilities will have new permits, contamination standards, and will pay living wages and supportive benefits to the workers who store our recycling. And perhaps most important, we will have assurance that our materials are being recycled in a responsible way. We want to make sure that the materials we recycle are not causing problems here at home or in communities in other parts of the world. The RMA requires that our recycling go to responsible end markets that minimize impacts to the environment, public health, and worker health and safety. As you know, good communication will be, will be essential to roll out these changes across the state. The law requires the PRO to create new culturally responsible, or sorry, not responsible, responsive, culturally responsive educational materials for local governments to customize and use with their constituents. Improved education and outreach will help residents understand what can and can't be placed in the recycling bins and how to use their new modernized system. The RMA brings producers into the solid waste system as partners with governments, garbage and recycling companies, and community members. Now that these businesses will be directly engaged, they have an incentive to work with other players to improve the recycling system and reduce their products' environmental inputs. 
The PRO will also provide substantial seed funding for a new waste prevention and reuse program that will help vitalize Oregon's reuse economy, yielding even more environmental benefits than recycling. Our team has been working hard with many partners to implement the Recycling Modernization Act. We're over halfway through and have laid a strong foundation. An important step has been developing administrative rule language to facilitate implementation and the July 2025 launch date. DEQ identified the need to coordinate two rulemaking processes. The first concluded last November and we're midway through the second. The draft rules for the second rulemaking will be posted for public comment in June. Last year, we completed an initial statewide needs assessment to give local governments the opportunity to formally register their interest in receiving PRO funding to expand recycling opportunities. And many of you participated. We received responses from 35 of Oregon's 36 counties and 200 of Oregon's 241 municipalities. Um, and Kim will focus on the next steps for that in her presentation, getting more information about and confirming the details of those expansion needs. We've also launched several required studies during the last few years and kept ourselves quite busy. And currently we are excited to take a first look at the first draft of the PRO program plan, which is due in just 10 days on March 31st. The program plan is where the PRO tells us how it's going to meet all of its obligations under the law. And Kim will get into more detail about that during her presentation as well. And um, I'll just note that all this work um, took a lot of um, uh, collaboration with a lot of folks and um, DQ is very helpful for everyone who's been engaged. So I wanna dive into the new recycling lists a little bit. There is a list of materials local governments must collect and a list of materials the PRO must collect. Together, these two lists will standardize recycling throughout Oregon. A subset of the local government acceptance list is called the Uniform Statewide Collection List. It represents those materials that are suitable for collecting commingled together. How did we come up with these lists? We wanted, DEQ wanted, and the law required these lists to have a strong underlying environmental and economic basis. So we conducted complex modeling and analysis that considered the full cost to society of whether and how to collect various materials for recycling. Our goal is to help Oregon recycle better, not just recycle more. So here are all the materials that are required to be collected on route at least monthly from customers in cities over the population of 4,000. These materials also represent the Uniform Statewide Collection List or USCL, which means, as I said, they're suitable to put in the commingled cart. So what that means is if a material is not on this list, it cannot be put in the commingled cart. However, these materials do not have to be collected mixed together. They can be collected separately if the local government prefers. Um, alongside with the materials um, on the USCL, the local government acceptance list includes motor oil and scrap metal, that are required to be collected at regulated depots or on the side. And there are also two materials at the bottom of the slide that are specific to the metro region around the Portland area. The PRO uh, is also required to collect an additional set of materials for recycling at a network of collection points they will set up around the state. So uh, a few notes about the PRO. The PRO must meet performance standards and convenience standards for their collection points. They also have to meet collection targets and send materials to responsible end markets. Um, so one thing that local governments and service providers should know is that before setting up collection depots, the PRO must first attempt to contract with any existing recycling depot or drop-off center to provide for collection of covered products. So what this would mean is that the PRO would um, be covering the cost for the existing depot to collect the materials that are on the PRO's recycling acceptance list. So that's a conversation that um, the PRO will want to have with local governments and service providers 
starting this summer. So um, I'm sure Kim will um, will touch on that presentation as well. As we mentioned, there have been significant changes to the opportunity to recycle law um, in terms of what is required for local governments. So um, currently, uh, there, uh, the depots are required to collect the new materials uh, that are on the, oh my gosh, I lost all of my windows. Where'd they go? Oh, there we are. Whew. Couldn't see my slides anymore. Um, collect the materials on the new material uh, list and ensure that commingled materials go to approved processors. Uh, as we said, um, only the materials on the USCL may be collected commingled. And um, there is a requirement that beginning January 1, 2026, local governments uh, must ensure that uh, collection containers that are purchased have a minimum of 10% verified post-consumer recycled content. And then um, for larger cities, um, at least 4,000, um, they must uh, collect materials designated for recycling collection from on route customers at least monthly. Uh, there will be uh, new contamination reduction program required. So um, DEQ will approve a list of contamination reduction programming elements and local governments can choose options from that list and um, work with uh, their customers to um, reduce contamination in the recycle. Local governments will be required to customize and distribute um, PRO created educational resources to promote the uniform statewide collection list. And beginning July, 2026, they will be required to offer service um, to multi-tenant properties and ensure adequate space for recycling at multi-family properties. And we'll talk more about um, this first um, bullet here um, in just a bit, that there is an opportunity for communities to authorize uh, service providers and other partners to receive compensation uh, directly from the PR. So we'll talk more about that. And then while we did conduct the first needs assessment um, last spring, there will be future needs assessments. So uh, local governments have an opportunity to participate in moving forward. So I want to uh, familiarize you with the different streams of funding that are available um, to, uh, that are available to local governments and designated service providers from the PRA. So there are new obligations and there's new funding um, associated with it. So I'm gonna go through each of these one by one. Um, so this first one is related to um, service expansion uh, requests that were made through the uh, first needs assessment. Uh, there's funding um, for new and expanded collection services and deeper. So startup costs for on-route programs are eligible costs, and then startup and operational costs, including staffing, are eligible costs for recycling depots. Um, this um, this kind of the scope of the um, the work and the funding will be worked out with the PRO um, through an agreement. And so the PRO is wanting to um, start those conversations as soon as possible. And we'll be reaching out soon to, um, to work through those. Kim will be talking more about that. Um, there's transportation funding available um, for distances more than 50 miles from a depot or reload to the nearest processor and market. And that covers receiving, consolidating, loading, transporting, staffing. Um, it only covers covered products. So um, loads of fully commingled materials um, will need to apply a percentage 
um, and DEQ has conducted a waste composition analysis and has um, information about uh, the average uh, ratio of covered products to non-covered products in um, Oregon's chemical recycling. As I mentioned earlier, um, local governments, 4,000 um, in population and greater are required to conduct new um, work with their customers to reduce contamination um, using an approved list of contamination programming elements, DEQ will provide. Um, they that there's eligible funding uh, up to three dollars per capita per year for that work, and so communities are required to conduct the work um, to the extent that PRO funding is available for that work. It is available not just to the communities required to do. The programming. So if a smaller community wants to conduct the, the programming work or similar programming work, they are also eligible for the $3 per capita per year. Um, and I, I think it's a interesting, um, the way that the, the funding is provided on a per capita basis. Um, you know, it means that some communities will receive a lot, some communities not so much. Um, so I think it's an opportunity for conversations among um, maybe at the wayshed level or neighboring jurisdictions to talk about like, is there a way to, if you're a smaller set of communities to um, work together um, and maybe pool resources. Um, so local governments are also required to um, ensure that the materials that they collect are periodically evaluated for contamination. If materials are sent to a commingled recycling processing facility, that contamination or that evaluation will happen there. Uh, if the evaluation does not occur at a recycling processor, then um, like at a reload facility, for example, um, then the local government, there's a, there's eligible funding for, for that evaluation to happen. And finally, um, as I said, local governments, um, are required to ensure that the collection containers are, uh, post-consumer recycled content beginning January 1, 2026. And to the extent that that, um, recycled content container is more expensive, um, that incremental cost is an eligible cost um, to be paid. So um, lots of different types of funding. Um, and the funding has to be, has to go to the entity that will be incurred the eligible cost. So whoever's doing the work and sometimes that is a local government, and sometimes that is a service provider or a waste that like a county um, or other other partners. So um, it may be that lo local government would prefer not to receive that um, funding from the PRO, but to just pass it along directly um, to the entity that's actually uh, incurring the eligible cost. So. There is a funding authorization process, an opportunity to designate service providers or others um, to receive the PRO funding directly. And this is a choice that local governments can make and they can authorize some, all or none of the funding. And that can vary by type of funding too. So for each of the different types um, of funding streams, they can make a different choice. So the law, requires us to, um, for this funding authorization process to happen as part of the opportunity to recycle reporting, um, which as you guys know, is sent out um, typically in December. So um, here is a schedule for the funding authorization process. We will have draft forms available um, in early fall, end of summer, early fall for your review. 
And in December, we will be sending out those forms. And those forms will go not just to um, communities that typically receive the opportunity to recycle report, but they will be sent to all communities because all communities um, have the opportunity to receive this funding, or some of it at least. Um, and then those forms will be due back to DEQ in the spring. And then you may need to change them over time. Um, so there will be an annual update um, each winter that if you need to make a change that you could and it would be effective July 1 of that. And so there's a lot uh, coming up this uh, in the next year plus as we look towards that program launch in July of 2025. And I just wanted to kind of show it visually so you guys get a sense of like uh, what's coming down, down the road. So uh, this spring, uh, I think uh, there will be work to, if you um, participated in the first needs assessment survey to refine work with partners, work with service providers, um, discuss internally and refine those service expansion needs requests um, and start to gather data about what is your existing uh, system look like, service look like, um, and what's on the ground now and, and what is needed. Um, and that will help prepare you for those funding discussions with the PRO, which will happen this summer. And re relating to the funding authorization, I would start now talking about what type A do you want, like working with your partners, working with your service providers to, to talk about, do you want to um, authorize um, others to receive fun funds on your behalf? And if so, what is the process internally that you need to go through um, with your city council or your board or your commission? Um, what kind of agreements might need to be in place? Um, also in terms of other processes that are going on, um, down on the bottom, we have a kind of opportunities for engagement. If you are wanting to uh, get more involved, uh, the PRO program plan draft, as I mentioned, is uh, due at the end of this month, and then we will have a comment period in the month of April. And then uh, we're also uh, in the middle of our second rulemaking, and the draft rules will be available for public comment in the month of June. The PRO is working on drafts of the educational materials for the uniform statewide collection list. and. Um, is required to consult with local governments and service providers on those materials. So during this summer and fall, I think there will be opportunities to provide feedback on those as well. And then looking towards the fall, oh, sorry. Um, we will have those draft authorization forms for your review um, and a draft list of the contamination reduction programming elements uh, for you to review. There will be a second draft of the PRO program plan in October. And then we will be sending out the final funding authorization forms at the end of December. And so then you would need to really like work on going through that internal authorization process process and getting signatures from um, whoever has the authority in your organization to uh, deal with funding and also the signatures of your service providers or other partners that they are receiving that funding. Um, sorry, I'm still looking at this. Uh, the signs Funding authorization forms will be due in the spring. Um, and uh, then we get to uh, July, 2025. And that's when um, a lot of things start. So the new collection requirements, the new statewide list, 
And depending on PRO funding, um, that can be phased in if, um, if needed. The <clears throat> contamination reduction program, um, that's when the launch date would be for developing and implementing that contamination reduction program. And that's when the PRO funding starts to become available as well. And then there are other um, dates to pay attention to, um, like purchasing the collection containers, um, recycled content containers, and then um, offering the opportunity to recycle at multi-tenant properties in 2026. Um, so just uh, wanted to kind of put some of these things under radar and um, especially the ones in the near term for having those conversations with service providers. Okay, you can move on now. Okay, so as I said, um, starting those conversations now is, is really the most important action step um, after this webinar. Um, and determining your internal process for funding authorization. And then we also have um, developed a survey um, for you to start thinking about who at your organization would be the primary contact for the PRO uh, to reach out to have those funding conversations. And if there are any additional folks that you want at the table for this conversation as well, you can uh, also include that so that when they reach out, the PRO knows the right person to talk to. And uh, a few more almost action steps. Uh, we encourage you to check out our website um, and learn more about the RMA. Sign up for our newsletter. We have a monthly newsletter via Gov Delivery. And I think um, we're putting some of these links into the chat. And then also, I know I went over all of this really quickly. Um, we are planning to uh, reach out with more details about new obligations, new requirements for local governments um, that will come to you from your DEQ regional specialist. So in June, they will be reaching out and um, can provide a lot more details than I did today. All right. So this might answer some of the questions that are coming up in the Q&A. Uh, so the slides, we're gonna post these slides uh, online. We have everyone's email who registered for this webinar. So we will, uh, we can email that out to everyone as well, but also please sign up for the uh, Gov Delivery. One of the links there that Stephanie just put in the chat can get you to the, the right place there. And then again, uh, because we're, might be a little short on time today because there's a lot of information. We'll also create a FAQ with all of the answers to the questions we got here and both uh, with folks when they registered, they asked some questions. So we'll send that out as well. So there's gonna be more information coming for you. And then again, like uh, Ariane said, your regional specialists are also gonna be some of your RMA superheroes on this one. So uh, I think we have a couple minutes for questions, Ariane. Did we want to do that now or wait till um, Kim? Yeah, you know, I was just thinking it might make sense for us to uh, hear from Kim and then um, and then do the questions at the end. Excellent. I think that sounds like a good plan. So I'm going to stop sharing and... Kim and Doug from CAA are gonna take over. Great, thank you so much. Um, DEQ, this is a great way I think to kick off where we're headed. We are at a pivotal point. We're submitting our program plan um, on the 31st and we'll quickly be moving into implementation and um, having the opportunity to connect with local governments and their service providers on this webinar really is key um, because you guys will be central to the initial outreach that we do to get uh, the implementation phase underway. Um, before I launch into what implementation will look like, I'd like to invite Doug Mander, who's been serving as the program manager here uh, for Oregon through the rulemaking process for um, probably almost a number of years at this point. He's gonna go ahead and give you an overview of kind of who CAA is um, as an organization and what the PRO will be doing as part of the system. So Doug? Yeah, thanks, Kim. Um, yeah, as Kim mentioned, uh, my name is Doug Mander. I'm the Oregon Program Manager for 
Circular Action Alliance. Um, if you can toggle to the next slide, I can provide a, just a, a brief overview of our organization and you know our plan submission, and then turn it back to Kim to talk go into a lot more detail about uh, you know the follow up work we're going to do in relation to the needs assessment that uh, Ari Ann mentioned. So as Ari Ann indicated, we are a not for profit. Uh, Corporation of 501c3 that's been established. Uh, the company logos that you see on the uh, screen are the 20 um, food, beverage, and consumer good um, companies that have formed CAA to uh, to act uh, to, to act on their behalf to in, in, and fulfill their obligations under a number of emerging EPR laws throughout the United States. Um, so we have been approved as the pro in California and Colorado, which are both single pro states in those under those EPR statutes, at least in for the initial plan. We've also um, been designated as the pro to work with the state of Maryland in the development of a EPR law in that state. And so the idea behind a national organization, um, if we go to the next slide, is that we can create some efficiencies uh, across different EPR statutes. Now, all of these statutes are unique, but our mission is to provide kind of a, the best in-class compliance services for, for producers across multiple states. Um, and so there are a number of uh, types of functions, uh, say that uh, Ariane mentioned, where each, uh, each producer in each state is required to pay fees based on the packaging um, that they supply to these different states. And even although the laws are different in each state, and even in some cases, the obligated packaging may be slightly different, um, it makes sense to have a, a, you know, a portal system and a producer reporting system that is operating on a national level um, so that we can gain some efficiencies of scale there. Also, in terms of program implementation, there are some other areas like complying with REM requirements, harmonization of certain features. Uh, the more that we can do those across states, um, in some ways they improve the effectiveness and, and some of the intent of the local laws. So Oregon, for example, has uh, requirements to incent producers to improve the environmental outcomes of their packaging to the extent that some of these eco-modulation requirements across, are operating across multiple states. It gives a, uh, you know, a greater volume of packaging for the producers to consider in terms of changing some of the packaging that they're introducing to the different states. So our priority is really to implement program plans that are responsive to the needs of each state, but enhance the management of those systems through a, a national organization. Uh, and the next slide, this is a, called the tip of the iceberg. My name is Doug Mander. I'm a consultant based in Toronto, Ontario, has a lot of experience with stewardship programs here. Uh, some of which have been operating for a couple of decades. Uh, Kim is going to be doing most of the presentation today. Is Oregon based and familiar to many of you? Um, I think I was. Uh, I've joined the CA team at the end of 2022. I think that I was project team member number six, and now we have about 40 to 50. So the organization is going to continue to grow and expand as we move from program planning into a program implementation and these are uh, four individuals who are very involved in the Oregon plant pr program but um, you know behind them is a team of uh, three or four dozen other people who are also making contributions to our program plan. So the RMA is really as, as Arian indicated a shared model so it, it it's sort of built into the concept is that there's got to be a lot of cooperation between pros local governments and service providers to design and implement the various program elements so our objective is really to work uh, work with local governments and service providers um, to implement proposals that work uh, work for your state, build on the strength of existing recycling services, and to really make sure that our proposals are addressing local needs, but also informed by that in-state uh, expertise. So it's really a lot of it's about creating the uh, the right dialogues over the course of the RMA operations, so that you know, we can address challenges and develop solutions uh, to issues that come up over the act as we move from, you know, the planning stage into the implementation stage and roll out many of the improvements that are anticipated under the statute. Uh, and this is just a, an overview of the timelines where we are. We're obviously very close to the, the left part of that um, slide. We will be implementing a plan within 10 days um, and then that will go through an ORSAC review uh, 
and we are anticipating that we will be required to to submit a second plan around the end of September. Uh, and in that intervening period, uh, we are going to do uh, really accelerate the outreach that we're planning to do with local governments and service providers to further develop some of the program plan elements. Uh, one of the unique aspects of the Oregon statute compared to some of the other states, it is a, it's a what's called a multi multi pro state in that um, it it permits multiple producer organizations to operate, um, and one of the consequences of that is some of the program development tasks uh, have been kind of held back in anticipation of there potentially being multiple pros, as there were four pro four organizations that indicated an interest at some point in 2024 uh, to being a pro. Uh, most of those other organ those other organizations have all dropped out as far as we know. So at this point, we're anticipated we would be the only pro. Um, and so all of the what are called interim coordination tasks would be assigned to CAA, uh, which uh, will begin shortly. And to, Kim will talk a lot more about that process. So the rest of, as we move through 2024, um, we'll be revising the plan but also doing a lot more work that is related to implementation and sorting out some of the details that we need to um, fit, finalize for, uh, to meet some of the, the plan elements in the statute. Um, we anticipate and we're hoping that we could get approval of that plan by the end of the year, and then move into more detailed discussions with local governments and service providers, finalize the contracts that would be necessary to implement the program on the start date, and with respect to the sort of optimization funding, uh, the disbursement funding would be beginning um, in after that program starts on July 1st, 2025. So that is also the date, uh, July 1st, 2025, in which producers are obligated to be part of the program. So that's when we start to get our, um, our revenue stream coming in with related to, related to all the funding obligations that the PRO has under the statute. So this slide just gives a bit of an overview of some of the components of the program plan. And we develop teams to sort of different teams to work out the details of what you'll see in the plan in some of these areas. Uh, the first two, the local government needs assessment follow-up and, and the rollout of the compensation programs and the design of the pro collection system. Kim is gonna go into a lot more detail on. Um, we're also going to develop education and outreach materials for local governments to utilize to fulfill their obligations under the OTR. So we'll have proposals in the program plan on timelines around that. We'll also have details on how we will ensure that materials collected under this new recycling system will be going to responsible end markets and the process that we would use to verify those responsible end markets. Um, Finally, we can make recommendations under the plan to add materials to the USCL. So you'll see some information in the plan on that. We're also obligated to describe how uh, specifically identified materials, and these are materials that have been designated for further work by DEQ, how we would propose to uh, manage those specifically identified materials. Uh, and that will be another component of our plan. And then finally, uh, the plan will include a preliminary um, materials fee schedule uh, and a budget for the two and a half years of the program. And I think that was one of the questions that someone had, um, uh, you know, in terms of the registration process, when will those fee schedules be coming out? So you will see a very preliminary fee schedule uh, in this program plan. Um, a lot of the information we need to accurately forecast both the cost of the program and how much material is going to be supplied into the state by producers. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about both of those elements. So that initial fee schedule will be very tentative and that will be refined over the course of 2024 uh, and, and beyond as we move closer to program planning and implementation. But those are the, the main elements of the um, program plan and you know, at, at the end of the day, uh, we've been out there talking to some uh, local governments. We, I'm sure, you know, Kim and I and others have been dialoguing on some of these issues with a number of representatives over the last few months. But in terms of the statewide initiative that we have to undertake, we need a much better understanding. 
of existing services, material flows, and you know, existing program pra practices to really be able to, to assess the, uh, the needs assessments at the details of the needs assessments in each local jurisdiction. Um, so uh, at this point, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Kim to run you through what we're calling the Oregon Recycling System Optimization Project. Great, thank you, Doug. Um, and really, so what we will uh, talk about uh, this next phase, the, the goal of this next phase is to get at exactly what, um, you know, Doug just mentioned, that we really need a better understanding of the existing system um, so that we can move forward with best designing it with you all as the local governments and service providers um, as we move towards that July 1 implementation date of next year. Okay, um, so, so why is the recycling system optimization important to CAA? Um, as an organization. First, the many of the pieces of information uh, that we'll be obtaining by engagement with um, local governments and service providers is going to directly flow into helping us further refine that program plan, um, which we'll be, uh, you know, obviously submitting on the 31st and then working to further revise for uh, submission again in September. Um, what we hope to get information that will help us offer more clarity on is the schedule for implementing some of the uh, collection program expansions and improvements. As Doug mentioned, you know, that funding starts July 1st, um, so we'll be building out um, that funding schedule from there. We'll be uh, working to determine the methods um, for the funding reimbursement amounts. Um, and beginning to get really some, some good insights into um, what the total costs will be looking like um, and how we will allocate those costs throughout the system across Oregon for each year. And so given um, kind of the preliminary nature of the first needs assessment, we will be building off of the information provided in that first study in, in 2023. Um, but because uh, the information wasn't terribly specific, those initial cost estimates that you'll see for the system in the pro program plan, it's going to have a significant range. But like I said, this information will help us continue to further narrow that down and get a much more clear picture. Um, so right after that program plan is submitted, we are switching over into this implementation phase here and hope to engage all of those local governments who did participate in that first needs assessment. Um, so let's begin with that first needs assessment. Um, I actually had the chance to be uh, kind of kind of see the process in play. Um, I'm on the Solid Waste Advisory Committee here in Columbia County, where I live. Um, and much like all of you, you know, we received uh, the survey of information. DEQ was helpful, their contact in helping us understand the program, but there were some limitations. Uh, one of those is, is the timing of that first needs assessment. Local governments were asked to identify what they may need to support the system expansion without yet knowing what all they would be asked to collect, right? We hadn't yet had that accepted materials list um, approved by the EQC yet. So there was um, kind of a, a lot of assumptions that had to be made. Um, so I think we all kind of did our best, right? To uh, be responsive at that time and understanding that there was gonna be, that was just the starting point of a conversation. And so this is where we're really picking that up. Um, some of the other limitations uh, of that first survey, you know, we really need to understand um, why people have identified the need so we can pair those funding priorities against what's required of us in statute. We are required to prioritize communities that need different things. Um, and so we need to understand a little bit better about where that request is coming from. Um, we'd also, you know, we didn't uh, really get a lot of information about how some of the requests could be coordinated amongst cities or amongst counties. Um, and we also, uh, you know, didn't really get, um, you know, the, the broader picture where we could consider some of those, uh, you know, geographic considerations, making sure that the rural communities in Oregon are, in Oregon are getting, um, you know, the same level of service that you're going to see in the metropolitan area. We want to make sure that, you know, our investments will be equitably applied across the state. And so, um, and we want to make sure too that this is a process that fully includes um, integrating some of that local government and service provider feedback. So uh, what we will need to do is really kind of, we'll begin with those needs assessments as a starting point for the conversation, and then work to gather more information and really come up with what we hope is um, a way of kind of right sizing what um, the investments that we need against the anticipated volumes and all of the changes that each individual community will have to be making. 
Okay, um, so how we propose to maybe overcome some of those limitations of the first needs assessment in this broader system optimization effort. Um, we really do propose where possible to take a waste shed approach. Um, while each community will be individually reached out to, we hope to be able to coordinate some of those conversations, perhaps at the county level, again, where this is possible. Um, we understand that we'll have to adapt our process to meet the needs of each community and each waste shed, um, but that's our goal, to see where we might be able to drive some broader system efficiencies. Um, and then we also want to understand kind of the, the unique uh, conditions that may be existing in each jurisdiction. And, um, you know, those might not be something that we can just obtain through a survey, right? This is going to be an ongoing dialogue. We'd also like to confirm the existing infrastructure that's in place so we can really begin to identify what those gaps are when we think about where the system will be expanding in terms of either, um, you know, new program delivery or new materials added to the system. Um, and what is kind of uh, different and outside of the initial needs request, we also want to fold into the discussion which communities operating depots might want to also participate in that pro depot network. So this, this conversation with the system optimization project is going to be a bit more expansive um, than, uh, you know, what was asked about in just the first needs assessment there. And so from all of that, CAA will develop that schedule uh, for processing those claims for reimbursements over the first, the two and a half year period of the first program plan. Um, and those finding those those final funding amounts um, will be determined kind of based on some of that broader, uh, you know, uh, waste shed coordination where we can. And then you will see a much more clear picture of that plan in the second program plan. Oops, oh, sorry there. Did that go back to slideshow for you? You guys seen the slideshow? Yes. Okay, <laughs> all right, so first step, we really need to understand what systems you have in place. Um, and so um, to do that, you know, so to do that, we will be asking some pretty detailed information of each community, um, you know, trying to get a sense of what is your service currently look like? What are the mix of customers that you're serving in the region? Um, so we'll be asking questions about um, kind of, you know, how many routes you have, the number of customers on those routes. Um, let's talk about, the types of trucks you're using for those um, on-route services. Uh, what percentage of, of customers within your jurisdiction uh, may be self-hauling, particularly uh, those for the county. We want um, to really understand to the inventory of current equipment being used. Um, and when it comes to uh, areas like reload facilities that may be handling both covered products and non-covered products, USCL materials and non-USCL materials, really understanding kind of the breakdown of the, the materials that are flowing through the system and how that equipment is used to manage all of those materials. Um, we want to identify any um, underutilized capacity that may exist at some of the reload facilities. And uh, it will be important for us to really map the flow of the materials running through the current system, um, primarily because, as Doug mentioned, the Producer Responsibility Organization does have a responsibility for managing those materials responsibly through end of life. And we're also responsible for um, some of the transportation reimbursement fees. So really getting an understanding of that material flow is key. So um, what we are doing to help each community prepare for this discussion, the team right now is preparing um, kind of a suite of tools, what we're calling like preparedness tools, um, to help you all ready yourselves for engagement with CAA and our team. Um, when we're ready to come back and really talk about what your specific needs are. So um, just to give you kind of an example of the types of resources that we're building. So we're giving, um, we're, we're putting together kind of a, a guidance document um, that will tell you more about the RMA, um, walk you through kind of how to estimate, well, how your volumes might change or where you need to anticipate your system growth and walk you through eligible expenses. Then we've got kind of what we're calling worksheets um, that will help you gather and organize information on kind of all of these areas of the system. So from on-route collection to depot collection, um, what's happening at reload facilities, and then we'll have a separate sheet for transportation reimbursement considerations. Um, so these documents will be made available off of the CAA website. And so local governments and your service providers, you will have the opportunity to access these materials, begin to work through them, at your leisure, bring in your partners, schedule the meetings you need to to schedule um, so that you can be ready. 
when our team um, initiates you know, that contact um, to look through your specific needs. And so we hope to have these resources available set by about mid-April and we'll make um, the community aware when they are. Okay, so just uh, kind of diving a little more deeply into those different areas, service areas, the type of information that these worksheets will walk you through. Um, you know, we will ask you uh, to consider, say for on-route services, like I said, we'll ask what type of trucks that you're using, uh, what your collection can, what you're using, what you are currently using for your containers for collection, whether it's roll carts, um, you know, Kirby's both. Um, we'll want to know about kind of the current onboard contam contam contamination monitoring equipment you might be using, um, you know, explore what type of new program promotional literature you might need. Um, if you're going to need, uh, you know, to hire new staff and train new staff, we want to be aware of that and any other kind of uh, safety equipment um, material that you might need, um, because these would be considered some of the eligible expenses for local governments. Um, and again, we will wanna map the flow for on-route materials. We'll wanna map that flow from the curb to the CRPF, another acronym perhaps for you, that would be your MRF. Um, and similarly, if you are collecting glass um, and that's going direct to market, we would wanna map that flow as well. Um, we, I, I do want to offer here uh, some, some definitions of depots and reload facilities before we start talking about the information that we would like from them, because I think uh, particularly around reload facilities, we tend to use some other words interchangeably. Um, so according uh, to the program here, a recycling depot means a location where recyclable materials are accepted from the public or commercial business and transported to a location for consolidation, processing, or directly to an end market. Um, for a recycling reload facility, it's a facility other than a recycling depot where recyclable materials are received and consolidated and transported to another location for processing or response end market. So that one is, um, you know, a, a, a term we hear used commonly to uh, describe this, but also be a transfer station in some cases. Um, and I think it's important to note here that if you are a local government and say working with a community-based organization that serves as a location uh, for a collection depot, you will need to go ahead and uh, designate them or somehow authorize them as uh, your depot uh, or part of your depot network in this process. Um, and then just, I've uh, got some language there from rules about depots that you can reference. Okay, so for depots and reload facilities. So the types of things we'll wanna understand from local governments and their service providers are how many depots and reload facilities um, do you anticipate collecting the USCL materials? And again, um, the USCL materials are those materials that would be collected commingled on route. Um, and we'd ask you to consider what additional equipment you might need there. These are examples of some of the other expenses that would be eligible for reimbursement. So. Again, collection containers, signage, on-site monitoring equipment, equipment to move, compact, and bail the recyclables for shipment. Again, uh, some of the costs associated with hiring and training staff, that safety equipment, and some operational costs. Uh, so we'd like you to look at when you assess kind of what you currently have, start thinking about, do we need more depots according to the requirements? Um, or are we gonna need more reload facility? Uh, space? Are we going to need a new reload facility to accommodate some of our estimated increased volumes? Um, and then again, from uh, depots and the reload facilities, we'll also be asking to map the flow of the source separated depot materials. So what's collected at the depot through to that CPRF or end market again. And we will have uh, worksheets to help cover that as well. But as I mentioned, we're really going to be um, expanding the conversation beyond just uh, what you all need to help comply with um, the RMA, but also talking about, um, you know, if there's a willingness or uh, a desire to work with the pro to also host some of our materials. Um, and so uh, we'll be asking questions, you know, are you capable and willing of hosting? Um, I, we, we'd like to understand kind of the current mix if you have an existing depot, how what you're currently collecting and how you're collecting that. Um, for reload facilities uh, that would be receiving the transportation reimbursement um, uh, fees, is there an interest in the pro-voluntary transportation option? There is a 
um, in rule, there's the option that um, you could say, I don't want to deal with transportation. So producer responsibility organization, you manage that part. Um, for reload facilities, uh, we want you to begin to, to consider again what, what portion of that equipment and staff time would be is used for USCL material. So we can begin to get a picture of kind of how much additional capacity there would be to handle pro material and kind of what percentage of say time or um, cycle time, runtime, staff time would be used then to manage pro materials. Um, as uh, when Ariane showed the list of pro materials there, um, you'll see that there's some uh, aerosols and uh, pressurized cylinders. Those are going to need to be handled uh, through through systems very similar to household uh, waste collection systems. And some of you are managing either permanent collection systems or managing collection events. We'll want to explore that with you as well. And then there's also a requirement that um, we can, uh, you know, we need to collect the expanded polystyrene, but there's limitations to how far we can move that polystyrene across the state without being compacted. So we also need to figure out where there might be um, the ability for different uh, locations to house EPS densifiers for us. So we'll be asking questions about that as well. Uh, just a reminder, here are the uh, pro materials that will be collected um, at our sites. And so, uh, you know, as we, so as you start working through this exercise and identifying what you need, um, you know, we would also ask you to think about how you might prioritize those investments. Um, as, you know, uh, Doug mentioned and Ariane mentioned, that funding doesn't start flowing to the PRO until July 1st when those producers need to, to sign up. Um, so we will need to kind of figure out a schedule for those investments over time. So if you know that, um, you know, you're going to be expanding immediately to, uh, you know, 200 new households in your community, you can identify the parts that will be associated with that and the other kind of collection service equipment that would be needed for that. Um, that would maybe be a immediate top priority investment. Um, you say, well, you know, I've got a, a, some additional capacity at the reload facility. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if we're gonna need how much of an expansion we're gonna wait and see, you know, but I'm gonna go ahead and earmark an expansion potentially say for 26, 27. Um, so we would like to hear from you how you would like to prioritize those investments uh, so it can be part of those negotiations. Okay, um, so in addition to the funding that will be provided for the service expansion, there are some additional reimbursement opportunities for communities. Arian's already touched upon them, uh, but I just want to share a little bit, uh, get you thinking about a few other things uh, kind of uh, in preparation for the engagement with CAA. All right, so that transportation reimbursement. Um, in rule, it asks, well, we are uh, required to kind of uh, map out how we would, um, you know, uh, approach the transportation reimbursement. In rule, it's uh, suggested that rate schedules be developed by a zonal map. Um, in talking with some of the stakeholders, uh, it, it seemed like a, a mileage rate might be something um, that would make more sense, particularly for some of the larger counties in Oregon. And so you will see that uh, proposed in our program plan. And again, there's really two options here with the transportation reimbursement. So you could go for that mileage reimbursement, or you could, um, again, just take that voluntary transportation option through the PRO. So think about which way you'd like to go on that. For contamination uh, re, uh, reduction reimbursement, as Ariane stated, uh, each local government is eligible for reimbursement up to $3 per capita per year to support the contamination reduction funding. Um, DEQ will be putting together, uh, I believe, a list of activities that would qualify for this funding. Um, so once that comes out, we would really like each community to start thinking about which activities would you like to undertake. And do you want to undertake those directly, or do you want to work with um, a, a, a partner? That partner could be your service provider. That partner could be, uh, say, if you're a city within a county, um, that partner could be the county. So start having those conversations. Um, and then think about, you know, for the contamination reduction activities you would like to take on, try to estimate some costs uh, per capita for those. Um, and then also, you know, I know in Oregon, a lot of the uh, education that's done by communities around, um, you know, how to recycle, you know, how to access recycling, how to recycle right, 
um, those are bundled into messaging and communication uh, for OTR that's also often generally includes um, uh, reduction and reuse, right? So just thinking about kind of how you package uh, some of the, uh, you know, information that you'll have about the system coming from the pro with some of the other messaging that you might have say about around reduction. Okay. And then just uh, lastly here on the funding, um, and Ariane touched on this too, kind of thinking about the designations for funding. So DEQ is gonna manage the designations. Uh, I think Ariane said that survey is gonna go out in December of next year. Um, a few things to think about. So um, the transportation reimbursement that a city may um, be eligible for, you may be looking to designate funding to a hauler that runs a reload facility that you might not currently have a contractual relationship with. So for example, you know, uh, a hauler might be operating in city A and that material goes to the reload facility that's operated completely, uh, you know, separate by a separate hauler. So just thinking about, um, you know, maybe communicating and uh, having discussions with, uh, you know, other operators in the area that might not be, you know, contractually tied to you or providing services directly to your community. So just start thinking about that. And then uh, for the funding approach, particularly around um, the contamination reduction and some of the upfront investments um, for the, the system expansion, start thinking about whether um, you have the ability as a community to, to front that money um, and then ask for reimbursement, uh, maybe rather than waiting to get on that uh, investment schedule, um, or if you, you do need to have that upfront funding as well. So I think, uh, you know, our, our goal is to be flexible, as flexible as we can, and really work with communities uh, based on the resources that are available to them and what their goals are. And so uh, just one other thing, you know, as, as we're getting close to this kicking off implementation, which is very exciting, um, also just thinking kind of, you know, broadly beyond uh, just the system, the things that we need to think about, uh, you know, integrating into our communities and our, our efforts and our messaging. So while we're not really talking about much about education outreach today, that is a very uh, important component. And we've got a whole other team dedicated to that. We had a nice kind of uh, education outreach kickoff discussion with Washington County. Um, and so we will be providing a whole suite of resources and, you um, that too will have its own kind of uh, engagement opportunities with local governments. Uh, we definitely want to see examples of the education uh, outreach uh, materials that currently exist, better understand what we can do to better help reach communities. So be thinking about things like, you know, what are your current communication channels for education and outreach? What are you doing right now within the means of your budget? What would you like to be doing maybe um, beyond that if you had more resources? What are the language translations that you need in your jurisdiction? Um, the pro will be helping with that. I understand that's been a limitation just from a financial perspective for some communities. So that's another area that we hope we can overcome um, with the RMA. And so, uh, yeah, how can it be improved? And then just in general, kind of what would be the most useful type of support that we can offer you as a, you know, uh, a community um, in, in furthering your communication efforts? Um, and so uh, I, our team is already, um, you know, beginning some of that preliminary work and we will expect to see uh, and hear, I think, communications from them as well as we move through uh, this early stage of implementation. Um, so just a couple wrap up slides here. So actions for local governments. So identify the stakeholders that need to be part of your system optimization discussion. These, these conversations are really going to be kind of uh, concentrated between now and the end of August. Um, so starting starting early is only to your benefit and our benefit as partners in this. Be on the lookout for an email um, to your DEQ point of contact um, in mid-April, and that will alert you to the newly available resources that we have, those, those preparedness tools that we're putting together, and, and you can start working on those whenever you'd like. Work with your partners to um, gather that information, identify the gaps in the current system, and the equipment and support that you will need to successfully implement the RMA in your community. Um, engage with your team. Um, engage with our team when we reach out to you directly um, in Q2. And we very much do look forward to working with each one of you as we make this program a success across the state. Um, so I 
so just some questions to kind of leave with you. And maybe if you want to pop some answers into the chat, um, we do want to understand kind of uh, how best to engage with all of you. It is a broad community. We have like over 240 different communities to be working with. Um, so think about how it would be most effective to communicate with you. Periodic webinars, uh, more webinars like this as we move through the process. Uh, we will have a website with resources, but if there are specific resources you need, if a newsletter would be particularly helpful, we'd like to hear from you. Uh, we'd also like to understand, um, you know, is there additional information that you need to prepare for this? So maybe as you get into those preparedness tools to think, gosh, I've got a lot of questions about this, having some additional information about, you know, this area of the program would be, would be helpful. Let us know that. We'll develop those resources for you. And, um, you know, we'd also like to understand, are there... Are there elements of this program that you find challenging um, or uh, you know, need to, need to have a better understanding for? We'd be happy to build, say, like a webinar that focused specifically on that um, if other folks um, you know, have similar challenges or concerns about certain areas. So we do want to hear from you about um, how best our team can work to support each of the local governments as they move through uh, and prepare to implement as well. And there is our contact information. Francis is not on the call today, but he is uh, very involved in the Pro Depot system development um, and some of the engagement, soon engagement with CRPFs. Um, so he will be another person that is a resource to you. And with that, I think we have some time for questions. Awesome. Thanks, Kim. That was a lot of great information. And one question that we had about uh, the slides is, are you, uh, are we able to share your slides out as well uh, when we Absolutely. send them to the rest of them? Absolutely, yes. Excellent. So that's a, an easy question to answer there. All right. So we have uh, some DEQ folks on the call as well. And there's uh, lots of questions. We have about 10 questions in the Q&A. So if you have more, feel free to put those in there. We also uh, have been answering some of them. So there's some answers there. And again, we'll follow up uh, with uh, FAQ afterwards so that all of the questions, you have them all in one place, easy to reference. So I'm gonna go through, um, Arianne, Kim, feel free to, to jump in here. Other DQ staff, if you uh, have some, some points, you know, let us know. Um, and I'm just gonna go by the ones that are liked the most. So other folks had these same questions. So starting out with uh, one that we have two kind of questions here, but they're both pretty much the same. Uh, so Arianne, how are local governments to ensure adequate space for multifamily collection? And how are we going to enforce on that? Thanks, Alex. I, um, I didn't want to put that like in our um, write on it because I did want to speak on it um, directly um, because it is still um, under discussion. Uh, we do have a requirement for local governments to ensure adequate space uh, for recycling at multifamily properties beginning um, July 1, 2026. We are currently having conversations and we'll be bringing a, a draft rule concept to our rulemaking advisory committee on April 3rd, it's the next meeting on April 3rd, um, to talk about implementation of um, that requirement and um, what does it mean to be in compliance with that? Um, and what is the time frame for that? So uh, I would say more to come. Uh, the rulemaking process uh, still has uh, a few more stages left to go. So we will have the conversation with the rulemaking advisory committee. We will consider feedback. We will um, post draft rule language um, and that will go, um, then there will be an opportunity for public comment. We will respond to the public comment and um, revise the rules. And then it will go to the quality commission for their consideration and potential adoption. So in November, so a long ways to go still through that process. So um, it's hard for me to answer exactly at this time. So we'll make sure to keep you in the loop, though, as uh, more yeah. comes out. And, and that's why we really strongly recommend everyone to sign up for our newsletter so you are staying up. Uh, exactly. 
exactly. Yeah, I was going to say that same thing. So awesome. We're on the same page. Uh, all right, Kim, this one comes from Laura Liebrecht down in Rogue Disposal. Uh, she says, in most parts of the state, at least geographically, the service providers will be the entities that will be doing the work on all of this reporting on current systems and uh, determining needs going forward. Will local governments be able to just give CAA permission to engage directly with the haulers, transfer stations, reload, depot operators? Not sure if local governments will want to convene all of these meetings if not necessary. Yep, absolutely. And that's what we saw um, with some of the uh, engagement that we did uh, leading up to development of program plan uh, with the local governments that DEQ said go ahead and engage with. Um, we very much saw differences in how um, the, you know, some cities and service providers um, work and kind of who takes leadership in areas um, from metro areas to rural. And so we're prepared to, you know, work with either service providers or the local governments themselves whatever they prefer. And it would just simply take um, that local government saying, nope, go ahead and work with my service provider and keep me in the loop, you know, um, but but work directly with them. So that works. Thank you, Kim. And while we have you, uh, there's another one for CAA. Uh, asking to say more about funding and investments being right-sized to anticipate volumes. I'm concerned how this would impact rural communities. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, there may be, uh, and this is why we're, we, this, while we're looking at kind of, uh, you know, having a conversation at a waste shed level, recognizing that even what happens, even the changes that will occur with, within each jurisdiction within that waste shed might look very, very different. So let's just say, for example, you are a, a, a community that has very limited plastics collection right now. And so you're expecting to greatly grow the um, range of accepted plastics that would be within your system. So what we would do with you is um, think about, okay, from a, a volume perspective, how that's going to impact, um, you know, the, the materials that will flow through your system. And that's what I mean by right size. Um, so if we're anticipating, you know, a certain percentage increase the volume, making sure that we um, are, are appropriately expanding the system to meet that anticipated need. Um, you know, and then there are some communities that uh, may be getting brand new systems, right, and making sure that the system we build is appropriate for their population. Thanks, Kim. All right. So uh, this next one is, what key points should we share with our customers at this time? It's kind of a tough one because there's not much customers and uh, people in the state can do yet. So we don't want to share too much information about lists and changes uh, to confuse people before uh, the RMA goes into effect. So um, right now, if you go to the recyclingact.oregon.gov, there's a lot of resources there about the law. So if you are wanting to share something, there's some information there, high level about what's possibly gonna be changing. But until there's some action that your customers can take, we don't say, we, we recommend not sharing anything yet, um, just because we don't want the confusion to occur and uh, we want folks to, to understand it when they're able to actually engage with it. Okay, let's see, what's the, all right, this, this is a long one. So as a representative of local government, we have questions about the local government requirements as listed on your local government brochure. Our jurisdiction has franchises with privately owned service providers, so we would appreciate clarification on how our local government is required to ensure to quote ensure that commingled materials are directed to approved processors, ensure at a minimum the that materials identified in the statewide collection list are collected at disposal sites, implement new contamination reduction activities on and on, how are local governments going to ensure that these elements are being satisfied with private businesses when local government staff are probably not educated in these things? And what liabilities is the local government subject to if one or more of these elements are not satisfied? So uh, the question is about holding local governments accountable for um, 
the work that their service providers in many cases are actually conducting. Um, I think that um, as, as a local government, you have agreements with your service providers to, um, to provide the, the services um, at, um, that, you, that you are requesting, the collection services, the education, um, and so this is kind of in line with that, with that um, existing relationship that you have. And so it would be similar to um, requiring your service providers to collect um, and abide by any existing uh, laws and regulations that you already rules that you already have in place. So I guess that would be maybe beyond our our purview, but um, hopefully um, that that makes sense. This would be a, a great place um, to chat with your regional specialists as well, and some of your other cities and counties around you to ask kind of what they're doing. Um, you know, as CAA said, it's uh, important that you can work as a waste shed uh, to see how best to kind of lift everybody up together and make sure everybody's on the same page. All right, uh, the next question, I would love more clarity about when the funding is expected to be distributed. So Kim, this uh, might go to you. I understand that we are required to begin implementation July, 2025, but that's also the producer deadline and the fee schedule will not be created until after that. When should local governments expect to have money in hand? That's a great question. Um, so you are correct. Uh, money will start flowing from producers to CAA July 1st, 2025, when they are required to um, join the PRO. But we hope to have a, a really clear understanding as all of the communities that will be receiving funding as to kind of what that timeline and schedule is. And it is our goal to have um, that pretty well defined by uh, that that second program plan that we'll be submitting September of this year. Um, once that program plan is in, then we move into what we um, kind of are calling the negotiation phase with local governments, um, where we make sure that we, you know, agree upon, you know, what needs to be funded and when that funding would come to you. So while, um, you know, you might not get it July 1, you'll know exactly when you will be getting it. And I don't know if DEQ can speak to this, but, um, you know, I, it's our understanding that DEQ is not expecting all of the changes to be implemented July 1, 2025. So, Ariane, I don't know if you can kind of um, speak at all to, to what the DEQ expectation is in terms of, um, you know, where local governments need to be by when. Uh, yeah, I think there's an understanding that um, some changes uh, are dependent on PRO uh, funding and therefore um, can be phased in over time or um, undertaken as PR funding is made available. All right, well, we are actually over time by a couple minutes. Um, so any of the questions that we didn't get to yet, we will be following up with uh, the FAQ so that you can have all the questions. You can always email us as well. Um, join that gov delivery and keep an eye on that recyclingact.org and .gov to stay up to date with everything because we know there's a lot. And so uh, reach out to us or your regional specialists and CAA. They're also a great resource. Uh, so thanks for attending today. And we will uh, get uh, this information out to you soon, soon as we can get all the answers. Uh, <laughs> compiled for you and all of that. So thanks for attending today, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Kim. For the opportunity.